Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and welcome to this week's episode. I'm sorry, I was strumming my new ukulele. <laughs> yeah, I'm, actually, I'm really anxious to see it. Kevin Meiderman of Thompson, North Dakota, near Grand Forks, oh, made well, me what a... What spe- kind of finish does it have? It's, a, it? it's an exotic South American wood. Oh, and yeah, because he really likes those kinds. It of, is yeah. stunning. Yeah, we talk about that in the show. I drove yes. up to see him. Tremendous hospitality. He's a craftsman. He, he, he hosts little... Private salon concerts. Kevin Moiterman. Moiterman of, of Thompson, North Dakota. Mm-hmm. Go to his website. He's he's amazing. And he's got some great recordings out too. And he and he and his closest friend in the musical world is Leo Kotke, a name known oh, no, to yourself. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that was great. So now I have a ukulele. Now of course I need to learn to play it. You know how to strum almost anything. Well, now yes and no. And so I need to bring it in and have you look at it and appraise it and then teach me. I'm not sure that I'm appraising. Well, I mean I don't mean in terms of its value, but to, yeah. to to say here's how you need to learn how to play this thing. Yeah, he said he wanted it to have a big sound and it does. You, you know, you get on YouTube, you can learn anything there. All you need to do is learn three chords and you're off. I, my father, you know, my father said that if you can play Sunny Side of the Street, Babes yeah, Will heard, Love You. Babes, I've heard babes this will story love you. before. Yeah. Well, just, uh, you know, just <laughs> Never saying. worked for me. <laughs> me either, but you know, it's never too late. Uh-huh. Anyway, it was really a fun show because uh, we got Jefferson going this week. I, you know, we uh, the, the 1st of January being such an important date to him. Uh, for many reasons, really, but then we we talked about a number of occurrences. Well, this is what I love about this program. So we've done the January 1st program many times, but we've never done this before where you found these like these moments that happen to be January 1st moments. I think we may have talked about them, but— In different ways. But yeah. So, you know, I get tired of saying— Jefferson didn't believe in Christmas, but he did believe, you know, in the secular. We got some mail about that, too, yeah. But, but, I mean, I get tired of that because it's true, but it's like, oh, how many times do you want to say that? This this changed the rhythm of it. And then we had a digression on the world's largest cheese. <laughs> Who doesn't love that? And then I begged for hams from Smithfield. You know, <laughs> more gifts is my point. Uh-huh. Well, it, it was a, a letter we received. I want to say John Harner, was that right? About uh, the world's yeah, largest ham. John Harner, who listens in Colorado Springs, and that led us to uh, the world's largest cheese. But uh, the, the Danbury letter, uh, Baptist letter, so important is is probably the most significant uh, first, and maybe not personally to Jefferson, but it, from historical terms, it's... he could not have known when he wrote that letter saying that we need a wall of separation between church and state that it was going to rock American history. It ended up being a part of a Supreme Court case in the 40s or 50s, wasn't it? The courts have routinely used it as a, as a, as a paraphrase of the intent of the First Amendment. It's not in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's Jefferson's letter. But he, you know, A he, lot of people think it is, though. <laughs> he knew that posterity would be listening, and he wrote it beautifully. And I, my friend, uh, who is the um, manuscripts director at the Library of Congress, Dr. James Hudson, has written a lot about this, and he has looked at the original document. That's one of the glories of working at the Library of Congress. And they use these like super 3D scanners that can see behind things. Uh-huh. It's amazing because they can go to a blot and somehow penetrate beyond the ink and see what was there first. He shows that what Jefferson actually wrote was wall of eternal separation. Huh. And then he he crossed out eternal, thinking maybe that's a little too thick, overstating it, you know. But wall of that's that's how my point is that's how strongly Jefferson felt about this. And then we talked about uh, his wedding day and uh, the snowstorm and the 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 famous bottle of wine behind the books. And then we talked about uh, John Adams writing him on January first, sort of. Uh, reconciling, beginning their 14-year correspondence. Jefferson and Adams had quarreled. They lived in an age before mobility, and so they never saw each other again after the first days of March 1801. Adams goes kind of with his tail between his legs, humiliated and broken back to Massachusetts. He's licking his wounds. But then Benjamin Rush steps in and says, you know, it's not right that you and Jefferson should be unreconciled. You, the differences between you are not as important as the as the the solid um, history of the things that you two did together during the revolution. I want you two to reconcile. And finally, um, he talks John Adams into it. Adams writes to Jefferson on January first, like a New Year's resolution. He probably thought over the holidays, you know what? 
next year I'm going to write to this guy. So he writes this letter and Jefferson writes back. And pretty soon this, what some historians have called the richest correspondence between two presidents in American history unfolds. It's been several years. We should do that program. Yeah, we've done, well, we've done it once before. You actually gifted me the, the collection, the book of it, and I'm Lester still grateful Kappen. for Lester that. Lester yeah. Kappen Jr. has a one-volume edition of all the correspondence between Adams and Jefferson, including Abigail Adams. A friend of yours um, that uh, talks about how she cries oh, at the end of it because... Patty Limerick, the great right, Patricia yeah. Limerick, says that when she gets towards, like, in 1825 and she slows down because she doesn't doesn't want them to die. We have all that. And two more things before we go to the show. One is the Jefferson Hour Book Club. We're going to do six books this year. It's jeffersonhour.com forward slash book club. And let me just give you a little taste of it. The first book is called The Constitution Today by Akil Reed Amar, A-M-A-R. He's a friend of mine, Yale. He's fantastic. Second book, Jefferson, Notes on the State of Virginia. That's going to be hard. It's a long book, but yeah. it's a great book. Yeah, and, and free, too. Yeah, and it's great. Get it online. It's Jefferson's nothing. only book, and that's in uh, the second book of the year. The third, ding, 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 ding. Alexander Hamilton by Chernow, Ron Chernow. That'll take a while to read. That's a long one, yeah. He's extraordinarily good at what he does. The next one is one that I selected, uh, Humboldt and Jefferson, Alexander von Humboldt and Jefferson, a transatlantic friendship of the Enlightenment about it's – it's a great story. Je, uh, Humboldt was a, an explorer greater than Lewis and Clark. He visits Jefferson in Washington in 1805. And beyond that, um, one of each of ours, I recommended Robinson Crusoe. And then you countered with, yeah, but let's read Selkirk's Island. Yes, it's by Diana Suhami, and it's uh, an account of the island. I think it was called Juan Fernandez Island, but Alexander Selkirk was marooned there early in the 1700s, and that's the the basis of the book, Robinson Crusoe. It's a, it's a great fun read. All I know is that when they when they rescued him, he told them that he that he, they said, how have you fed yourself these 20 years? And he said, I run down goats. He's, he's virtually naked and barefoot. And they said, no, nobody runs down a goat. And they said, we will not rescue you till you demonstrate. And, and Selkirk actually ran down a goat to show them that that's a skill that he developed well, in order he, to he, survive. He had a way of sort of cornering them. Well, don't ruin it. <laughs> you know, you run down a goat. <laughs> no, thanks. Yeah. All and right, then so, finally, finally, yeah. in, in, in the last book of the year will be the Thomas Jefferson Bible which um, and many different editions, you can get them free online, but this one happens to be the Smithsonian's edition. Jefferson never intended his uh, personal Bible to be printed, but it was done by Congress of the United States. So to review, um, The Constitution Today by Akhil Reed Amar, Notes on the State of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson, uh, Ron Chernow's Alexander Hamilton, Humboldt and Jefferson, A Transatlantic Friendship of the Enlightenment, Robinson Crusoe, and Selkirk's Island, and finally, the Thomas Jefferson Bible. And again, you can find uh, find that list at jeffersonhour.com forward slash book club. And I won't go into the long pitch, but boy, do we, we appreciate the support we get. And you can... And hams. You can find that. You and, can and find also, out how to do that at I'm, jeffersonhour.com. I'm, I'm, as I've said on a program just before the holidays, David, I read um, Robert Kagan's new book, the Jungle Grows Back. Me too. I urge every Jefferson Hour listener to get it. You got it online. I ordered mine physically. It's an extremely important book about where we are in the world. And I just very strongly urge people to read it and send in their thoughts and comments. Our our webmaster has already provided a critique of the book. So we, we, we would like to uh, do a show on that sometime. It's a very yeah, there's interesting There's two. The, the other one, and both of them um, came from articles that were written for publications and then later became short books. And the other one is uh, Michael Lewis, The Fifth Risk. Which, which I've I, read a bunch of, but not all of. That's and, really good. But, you know, when I came upon a reference to The Jungle Grows Back, I immediately ordered it because I, I'm i an admirer of Robert Kagan. His, his lens is the geopolitical world. I read it, and as I read it, I thought, a, every American should read this book. And and I thought, B, if you want to understand Brexit and Donald Trump in a non-judgmental way, this is not a political screed, it's not an attack. If you want to understand why the world is withdrawing from the liberal world order that, that's represented by the Marshall Plan, read this book. 
because it explains that Trump is not the he didn't create this. He's he's embodying and responding to a weariness that the first world feels about troops everywhere and policing the world's waters and shoring up NATO and the European Union and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, all of that. But the book club, you can go to our website, Robert Kagan's book, The Jungle Grows Back, which I very heartily recommend to everybody. And this week we talk about, I think, one of the most important of all subjects, uh, the wall of separation between church and state in a free society. Thanks for listening. Send in your contributions, hams, ukuleles, guitars, flutes. Or, or just mail. Or just, or just yeah. send in your thoughts. That's We like that. Thank you, folks. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is President Thomas Jefferson. And, sir, I haven't had the opportunity, but I, I'd like to wish you a very happy New Year. Thank you, citizen, and, and happy New Year to you. As you know, uh, New Year's Day was the one occasion uh, in the midwinter when I had a White House reception. It's also New Year's Day is quite a significant day in your life. Some very notable occurrences on, on New Year's Day. The one that comes to mind first is your letter to the Danbury Baptists. Could you share that with our listeners? Yes. When I was president, it was well known that I was a, an advocate of unlimited freedom of religion. I was nominally uh, an Episcopalian, an Anglican. I grew up in that tradition. I attended Episcopalian services in the course of my life and so on. But I was not particularly a believer in Anglican doctrine. And I was, in fact, not particularly a Christian. Uh, I believe that Jesus was undoubtedly the greatest man who ever lived. But I had significant doubts about whether he was the Christ, whether he was the Son of God. So this was relatively well known by the American people that I was uh, not a deep believer, not a devout Christian, that I was probably a deist. Some people thought I was an atheist. That's certainly not true. And so when I became president, there was uh, praise from some quarters because of this attitude I had towards religious liberty. And there was con condemnation from other quarters. There were people who believed that I was a, an infidel that a man with such views about something as important as religion could not be trusted with the high office and I should not be the president of the United States. There were rumors that I was an atheist, that I would confiscate Bibles, that I would outlaw Christianity, etc., none of which uh, proved to be true. But my point is that I did not come in, into the presidency as a mystery about religion. People understood that I was for absolute liberty of conscience and that there should be no civil reward or civil penalty for a person's religious views, whatever they turned out to be. So I got a letter from the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, thanking me for this position because they were beneficiaries. The Baptists would have been persecuted if we had had state religions or if we had had an establishment of a single religion in the United States. So they were uh, eager to, to thank me for my commitment to religious liberty. It's quite a, uh, uh, quite a complimentary letter they sent to you in October of 1801, encouraging you to further your positions. Yes, they wanted me to, they thanked me for, my, for what they took to be my position, but they actually asked me to clarify my view of this question. Now, I always enjoyed these moments when I could take a momentary communication of some sort, an opportunity to address an issue. And I like to step back on those occasions and ask myself, well, what – is there a universal principle here? Is there, is there a deeper, fundamental, self-evident truth here that I can use this occasion to articulate so that this has more than – it's more than just a reply to a polite letter. It's really an – an opportunity for me to try to state the case uh, in the most uh, rational and persuasive terms for 
what I believe to be the enlightened principles on, on some subject or other. So this is something that I, I had a habit of doing, and I use this occasion to try to clarify my understanding of, of this concept of religious liberty. And I said in, the, in my reply, which indeed was written on January 1st, 1802, at the White House in Washington, D.C., before uh, the reception, I got up very early and took care of my important correspondence before the main business of the day. And, and I said to the Baptist that my reading of the First Amendment was that it erected a wall of separation between church and state. And that phrase, wall of separation between church and state, went on, as you know, to become a a very important phrase that it it it, it took on almost constitutional um, potency in the course of of the jurisprudential history of the United States. I did, in fact, did not intend that. I simply intended to state in the clearest terms what I took to be the meaning of the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. But it went on to be adopted over time by by courts and by justices and by the Supreme Court as a as a tight, short paraphrase of the purposes of, of the First Amendment. So, so the letter turned out to be of one of the most influential and important letters that I ever wrote. I, I would not necessarily have expected that at, at that moment. Because you wrote that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God that he owes account to none other for his faith or worship. I do take note that you wrote this on January 1st and... Of course, January 1st was a very special day for you, sir. It's the day uh, where the year begins. It, it comes in January, a month named after the, the Roman god Janus, who had two faces, two visages, looking both backward and forward in time. And I opened the White House for the public twice per annum on the 4th of July and on January 1st. So that is a day of conviviality and a day that I observed as a sort of informal holiday uh, during the eight years that I was the president of the United States. But I worked on that day as I worked on Christmas and every other day of the year. You know, it seems to me that this is such an important point that individuals can be taxed. Under certain conditions, they can be conscripted into the army. Um, if they commit crimes, they can be incarcerated and, and jailed, and, and in some cases, um, their lives terminated. Uh, we can, under certain conditions, condemn people's property to build a turnpike or a bridge or a, a military installation. When you enter into a social compact, you entrust to your government certain of your natural rights. Uh, you you agree that there has to be some give and take, that a government needs funds to operate, and therefore there, there must be a form of taxation and so on. This is all part of the larger social compact. But there are certain rights that you do not entrust to government, cannot legitimately entrust to government, must never entrust to government, and there are certain rights that government must never attempt to intrude upon, and one of those is freedom of conscience. We, we share one thing. We're citizens. You are citizen X. I am citizen Y. We share that in our country. We've created that category. That's something that makes us common and equal. But we do not share our religious views. I don't know whether you are a Muslim or Jewish or Hindu or a Jansenist or that you believe in the great spirit, the Manitou of the Algonquin people, or the Wakan of the Lakota people. I have no idea whether you are Lutheran, or Methodist, or Catholic, or Baptist, or any other form of Protestantism or Christianity. It's none of my business. It's literally none of my business. You are free to worship the God of your choice in the manner of your choice so long as it does not break out into crime or antisocial behavior. But it, as I said in Notes on Virginia, and this was one of the most controversial things that I ever wrote, it does me no injury whether you believe in one God or 20 or none at all. It neither breaks 
my leg nor picks my pocket. It's of no consequence to me how you worship, what you believe, what are the dictates of your religious consciousness, and you have no interest in my religious consciousness and no right to intrude upon these things. This is a sacred area. These are unalienable rights. Our alienable rights are my right to entrust to the House of Representatives the, the need to tax me or to declare war on Canada or whatever it might wish to do. But I have an unalienable, absolute right to worship in any way I please and to, and to believe anything I wish as long as it does not break out into crime. Another January 1st I might bring up is uh, that of 1772 and the date of your wedding, sir. Well, I, I was married just once uh, to a, a remarkable woman named Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson. She was a widow. She had one child. The child, unfortunately, soon died. I was one of a number of Virginia gentlemen paying court to her. One of the things that uh, brought us into our into our harmony that led to our, our wedding was that she was uh, a musician. Uh, she had a beautiful voice. Uh, we sang duets together during our courtship. And I was fortunate that she agreed to be my wife. And we were married at the forest at her uh, father, John Wales's plantation down near Williamsburg uh, on the first day of January 1772. And we made our way slowly back to my home at Monticello. We were together for 10 years. Um, she was the mother of six children, um, most of whom died before they were adults. And then she died on September 6th, 1782. She was only 33 years old. We had been married for 10 years. I later said those were 10 years of uncheckered happiness. Uh, but the wedding was on January 1st, 1772, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And my understanding is, is that there was, a, well, according to your garden book, one of the heaviest snowfalls ever at Charlottesville. Um, and you ended up having quite an adventurous journey on your way to Monticello. We were going to take some time getting back to Monticello. This is how honeymoons uh, worked in our time. Uh, there were no inns or hotels to, to speak of, and we were slowly making our way from uh, the lower Chesapeake to the, to the uh, southwest mountains. But then there was this colossal snowstorm, and we eventually had to uh, ride horseback on the last few miles up the mountain to what was an unfinished home. Mr. Jefferson, we need to take a short break. When we return, perhaps you'd be so kind as to finish that story, sir. Indeed, sir. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Hello, listeners. We just wanted to sneak in one of our announcements between segments. People love the books that we recommend on this program, so we have instituted the Thomas Jefferson Book Club on The Jefferson Hour, and the first book will be in February of 2019. It's a Keel Reed Amar's book, The Constitution Today. And you can ask questions about the book if you've read it or if you just have a general question. Uh, the easiest way is to go to jeffersonhour.com and click on Ask a Question. Make note that it's about the book club. Now, all the other books are listed there. Plus, we'll be doing some interviews with authors like our favorite Joe Ellis. So this is a, a, a constant feature once every six or eight weeks on the Jefferson Hour, the Thomas Jefferson Book Club. We'd love to hear from you. Again, the Constitution today, and uh, if you'd like to ask a question, we need it by February 13th. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks, everybody. Get reading. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And Mr. Jefferson, once again, a happy new year to you, sir. And when we took our break, you were telling the story of, of your honeymoon. Uh, I believe you... you said you had to abandon your carriage and, and ride horseback because the snow was so deep. Monticello is a little mountain. In fact, that's the basis of the word in Italian. And it's 867 feet high. It's a considerable eminence. And a snowstorm came in and made it difficult for us to get to the house. And so we had spent about a fortnight um, 
moving our way from the Williamsburg area, from her plantation, her father's plantation at the forest back to Monticello, staying with with friends and relatives along the way. And this is, um, in many respects, a, a typical honeymoon. And then the snow came and we had to abandon our, our phaeton, our, our, our carriage, and, and make our way by horse the last few miles. And when we got there, it was dark. There were, The house had not yet been built. It was a construction site, but there was the South Pavilion, one of the little outbuildings that was going to be a Palladian anchor for the symmetry of the house, and it was essentially finished. I had been living there as a bachelor on the top of the mountain. And we moved our way in, built a fire, and then fortunately uh, we found a a bottle of wine behind one of the bookshelves tucked away, and we were able then to celebrate our homecoming, the diminutive brick shelter uh, she was a very good sport, and uh, then because of the marriage, I pressed to hasten the construction of the first version of Monticello. The first version is not the one people see in your time. It did not have a dome, but it was Palladian, and it, and it was being built at this time, and I wanted to make sure there was adequate comfort for my beloved wife, and so the the, the construction of the first iteration of Monticello proceeded apace after this romantic, somewhat uncomfortable honeymoon. I'm sure it's uh, something that the two of you shared throughout the rest of her life. It was a a marriage of love, not of convenience. She was a beautiful woman, a diminutive woman, uh, a a good housekeeper. She knew all the domestic arts. She could uh, cut out a beefsteak. She could uh, pluck chickens and and pull eggs from under them, and she knew how to manage household accounts and to manage a kitchen and to uh, to serve as the hostess. She had done some of this for her father. And so she was a good Virginia uh, housewife, in addition to being a very talented musician, a great conversationalist, a highly intelligent woman. But unfortunately, she had a, a fragile physical condition And it was exacerbated by her pregnancies that she was not one. My daughter, for example, Martha, had 12 children, 11 of whom lived to be adults. But my wife, Martha, was was frail. And her pregnancies, uh, each one um, was difficult. And the accumulative effect of all of this uh, debilitated her. And, And when she died on the sixth day of September 1782, it was essentially from being worn out and 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 her health collapsed in the face of of her pregnancies and the the nursing and the the slow recovery and the frankly the the barbaric obstetrics of our time you have my sympathy sir i'm certain that that is still a painful memory it was the most painful memory of my life. In some regards, I never recovered. It's said in my family that on her deathbed, my wife called me in and asked me never to uh, bring a stepmother into the household because she had been, um, had felt oppressed by a, a stepmother in her own time. And as you know, I never did remarry. And at the death of my wife, I um, suffered grievously. In fact, I had a kind of a breakdown over it, and it was such that I withdrew from the world, and members of the Virginia House of Delegates and and the the political establishment in Williamsburg um, were concerned about me. Some people made fun of me and and condemned me for being so deeply um, unnerved by the death of my wife and and. They, I don't think they really understood why this was so profoundly important to me. But I, I never fully recovered from that loss. The only other loss that that was anything like equal in my life was when my second eldest child, Maria, died in April of 1804 while I was serving my first term as president. And that was a, another just profoundly difficult period in my life. I I later said to Maria Cosway, a woman that I um, favored, 
that I was born to lose everything I loved. And in, in some respects, that's certainly true. Let's move on to something a bit more lighthearted, if we might, Mr. Jefferson. Certainly, sir. You received a uh, note mailed to you on New Year's Day in 1812. Um, I, I suspect you know the letter that I'm talking about. Oh, this is the first of the the John Adams letters. Adams and I had been very close friends and and, and colleagues back in the time of the Declaration of Independence and the Second Continental Congress, and then we had served together in Europe, in, in France first, and then he was off to the Court of St. James, and I was effectively the ambassador to France. So we had a long period of collaboration, and, and there was an affection between us that was more than simply a rational affection. There was a kind of a deep, a f- a abiding, a mutual harmony and even love, I think, between us. But then we quarreled over a whole range of things not worth uh, perhaps talking about. And when I supplanted him as president in 1800, uh, he took it very personally. And we never saw each other again. He left Washington City before my inaugural on the 4th of March, 181. He went back to Braintree to uh, the Quincy area near Boston and I never saw him again. We never, we never had another um, meeting face to face. But on the first day of January 1812, so I w- was now out of office for almost four years, and he was out of office for almost 12 years, he took the risk of writing me a letter because he, he, a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Benjamin Rush, had been trying to find a way to get us to communicate and to reconcile. And Adams took the first big step. He wrote me a, a letter uh, on the first day of January 1812, sending me what he called a couple of pieces of homespun. And I didn't understand that. I thought he meant actual locally produced cloth. His homespun actually was a two-volume account a two-volume book by his son, John Quincy Adams. It's sort of a light-hearted note. He writes, Sir, as you are a friend to American manufacturers under proper restrictions, which is an interesting choice a little, of phrase. A, a little political jab. Especially manufacturers of the American kind, I am sending you by the post a packet containing two pieces of homespun lately produced in this quarter by one who was honored in his youth with some of your attention and much of your kindness and finishes with saying, I wish you, sir, many happy New Year's. So what he did was send me his son, John Quincy Adams, two-volume, I think, History of Belletres. It was a it was a literary text. I should have, I should have understood this. The, the enclosure wasn't there, so the books did not come with the letter. The letter came separately. You had corresponded in 12 years. No, he clearly isn't intending me to understand that he's referring to his son, uh, the later president, John Quincy Adams. But when he said homespun, I thought, he's sending me a bolt of cloth. <laughs> and it, it hasn't arrived yet. And so this was, this eventually was all sorted out. But he, but but here's the genius of Adams. He, he, was, he was protecting himself. He was basically saying, look, I'm not writing you a letter here. I'm writing a cover note for a gift I'm sending you. Um, he was preparing for the possibility that I might not reply. So Mr. Adams was clever on a couple of levels at that point. When the wall between us broke, when Dr. Rush was successful in getting Adams to believe that maybe there could be reconciliation, uh, two things. First of all, I probably would not have ever taken the first step for many reasons, but I probably would not have reached out to Adams if he had not, in 1812, reached out to me. That's number one. Uh, and, And secondly, Adams, when he heard that I would probably receive a letter from him with, with pleasure, he blurted out, I love Jefferson. I have always loved Jefferson. And so even though lots of difficulties had happened between us and there was mutual bitterness and mutual uh, wariness, Adams had a, had a huge heart and he was able to say, I've always loved Jefferson. And then we were off and running. I, he wrote that letter. I wrote back a careful reply, not qu- quite sure what to make of it. I actually wrote about 
local manufacturing of cloth, in my reply. And then things began to warm up between us. And you continued this correspondence for 14 years, sir. It went on until the end of our lives, and we exchanged, I think, something like just under 150 letters altogether. He wrote many more than I did, but I tried to keep up. Here's one more thing to say about this, that Adams wanted the friendship. In a way, he had more to gain than I did because I was he was he was living in some obscurity. His presidency had not been successful. There was a lot of, um, there were a lot of, what would I say? Uh, he he had many critics and some enemies. I was the more popular figure. I, I was more uh, well known. My my fame, my celebrity was still running high at this point. There's a I, bit of jealousy, is what you're trying to say. Well, I'm, I'm not quite saying that. I'm what I'm saying is that. He was more eager than I was, so he really fueled the friendship. I, I, I replied less often. I had, a, I had a much more extensive correspondence than he did. I, I had grandchildren to, to – farms to try to fix grandchildren, projects. But, but my, my question, I guess, would be – one of my, to my comment is that you were recognized as, as um, iconic – during your time, that's a good word, and he and he was not quite, and he was he was a bit jealous of that. I he think. may have been, you know. I, now, do you think deservedly so? Well, I, th- I think it's more it's more complex than that, and even possibly more dark. It's not just that he was jealous; <laughs> he actually felt that I didn't deserve it. You know, he felt that I was overrated. Really, he think? actually says this in his in some of his letters. He eventually wrote a letter in which he said, "Look." I just want to say that Madison, for all of his faults, of course, that would be typical Adams, Madison, for all of his faults, has gained more celebrity and and public praise and and has done more for this country than you or I ever did, Mr. Jefferson. So he's throwing my protege, Madison, (laughs) in my face, saying that he's done more. But, I mean, I know this sounds ungenerous, but Adams believed that I was an overrated figure. Of course, he believed that almost everybody was overrated except for himself. But he this is true. He thought Washington was overrated. Let me steer you away from this before a hole is dug from which you cannot uh, Sir, I'm just, emerge. I'm, I'm merely telling you the truth. He, 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 he believed that I was overrated, and it therefore bothered him twice. It bothered him that I was more iconic, and it bothered him that he believed that the public was giving me a— a, a, a place in the pantheon beyond my desserts. And he believed that he was underrated, that he was in many respects the most important of the founding fathers, certainly equal to the others, and that the public had never understood him and that it was unfair. And to a certain limited respect, he felt that I was part of the unfairness, that I had helped to create the anti Adams atmosphere of the country a lot of reasons for that and that and that I had done him a disservice in that but for all of that he still wanted the the correspondence and wanted the friendship and did most of the heavy lifting over the next uh, 14 years in the course of that friendship Mr. Jefferson during my time it's quite common for people to make what they refer to as new year's resolutions in other words I promise to myself that I'm going to do this in the new year to improve my lot, my situation, which, of course, brought to mind something that you wrote, um, your canons of conduct. And I'm wondering if that wouldn't be a good place to start for those who who like New Year's resolutions. It's my resolutions were always the same uh, because I think the, the basic truths of life are known to all of us from a, fr- a fairly early age. But late in life, I received a letter from a person who who said he was naming his son after me. And would I write a letter of advice or uh, would I commemorate that honor? So I, I then in, in the course of that letter produced my own decalogue, my own Ten Commandments. Could I read these to you, sir, that you might comment? If you wish, sir. First, never put off till tomorrow what you can do today. No, of course. I mean, obvious that uh, procrastination is a is a very silly thing, and I think that's the basis of my immense productivity, that I, I did never put off anything that I could handle at that moment. Never trouble another for what you can do for yourself. 
Yes, of course, there should be a footnote there. I was a slaveholder, and I had a range of household servants, and I had secretaries and cabinet members, and you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't want to, to to sound too righteous about such a thing. But what I mean is, if if something needs to be done, and you're able to do it, do it yourself. Try to try to take on as many of life's um, uh, tasks and challenges as you can and not um, shove them off to others. Number three, never spend your money before you have it. Again, I should have been a little more vigilant on that one. We'll we'll go right to number four, sir. Never buy what you do not want because it is cheap. It will be dear to you. Well, that's an important one. It's hard for people maybe to understand it. What I mean is you you see something, you think, oh, that's inexpensive. I don't want it so much, but look at what a bargain it is. I usually find that that's a mistake. It will be dear by meaning expensive to you to buy something that you're encouraged to buy, not by its intrinsic desirability, but by what appears to be its economic advantage. Number five, pride costs us more than hunger, thirst, and cold. Self-evident, a biblical truth. Number six, we never repent of having eaten too little. Yes, a spare diet, a largely vegetable diet, one that consists of perhaps some wine but not ardent spirits, will prolong your life, ease your digestion, clarify your brain, and give you a sense of serenity. Number seven, nothing is troublesome that we do willingly. Of course, it, uh, you know, the, the, the modern translation would be it's all about attitude. Number eight, how much pain have cost us the evils which have never happened? Yes, so fretting about uh, and showing anxiety about situations or things that could or could not happen uh, has a huge and debilitating effect. It's important for us to let some things just percolate in the world of time and see if they happen or not. And number nine, take things always by their smooth handle. If you will follow that, your life will be dramatically improved. And finally, number 10, when angry, count 10 before you speak, if very angry, and 100. Harmony is the business of life. If if we judge people on their worst day for their worst moments, we'd have no friends. The world would be a desert for our love. People rub each other the wrong way, not particularly on purpose, but just because they do. Social life is sometimes difficult. It's important to maximize harmony, to minimize tension, and to avoid saying impulsively angry things when you feel riled up. Your mood will almost always become more serene if you just give it a little bit of time. Excellent advice, Mr. President. I have those 10 cannons your Decalogue hanging in my office. Not that I can follow them all, but I have them there. And I want to thank you, sir, for this conversation. Right now, we need to take a short break, but we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Hello, everyone. It's Clay Jenkinson. I want to invite you to come on the John Steinbeck Cultural Tour in Monterey, California, March 2nd through 8th. 2019. You know, I do these cultural tours on the Lewis and Clark Trail in Jefferson's Virginia and soon Jefferson's France. But the one that's immediately in front of us is John Steinbeck's America in California, in Monterey, 2 through 8 March 2019. Go to the website jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours and you can get all the information. Grapes of Wrath, East of Eden, The Red Pony, Cannery Row of Mice and Men, and we'll be visiting some of the most extraordinary places on the coastline of California. We'll see you there. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This is Clay Jenkins, not at the moment the third president of the United States, and I'm sitting across from Mr. David Swenson, the semi-permanent guest host yes. of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Happy to be, and a Happy New Year to you, sir. And Happy New Year to you. Before we go on, I want to say thanks to Kevin Moiderman, of Thompson, North Dakota, near Grand Forks. Thompson. I got my ukulele. I know that area. Thompson, Buxton, Reynolds. Right. I know that area well. And so he's a physician there. I, well, I may remember we talked with him on the I, show. I begged for a, a ukulele. He stepped forward. Beg is an accurate word. And you rebuked me. He came forward. I said then when he did it, I said, look, I'm not going to let you send this to me. I'm coming to get it. And so I drove up there. Kevin and his wife were 
tremendous. They live in a spectacular home. And he took me out in the shop, and he's made 150 guitars. You would love this, well, David. Well, I, I went to his website, and you remember the show that he was on. He was here to comment a little bit about we, his work. Right, and we uh, uh, we actually played some of his music in the outro of that show. And he has a great website. So he's amazing. I mean, look, this well, is— Well, you got to get to work because you, you need to take this on your cultural tours. And I know. I, 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 I have to play it out there in the Lewis and Clark Trail. But uh, this is—I mean, you need to come with me to see him. Yeah, I'd love to. This, he he to. makes guitars for some of the great classical guitarists of the world. Uh-huh. Leo Kotke is a close personal friend of his. He brings concerts in to his home. I, you know, I have a special place in my heart for luthiers. Um, my local fave is a fellow named John Lardenoy, who has helped me with many, many uh, instruments. And it, that's a great art. I love my ukulele. I'm I'm practicing over the rainbow and, uh, great. and uh, the sunny side of the street. Uh-huh. But I need your help because you know music and I don't. But thank you to Kevin. Um, it was one of the great moments of my uh, life to, to get his call and then to realize that this isn't just a guy who puts together a little ukulele. Uh, this is world class. So people should go to his sites. Kevin... Moiderman, and uh, you've been to the site. It's amazing. Yeah, it's great. Well, that leads me into a couple of letters. One leads me into a letter from Brad Chrysler. Chrysler's back. But before we go there, first off, um, it was it was a great fun conversation with President Jefferson this week. Thanks for you, the way you organized it around the first of January. Well, I thought that was appropriate. Right, and the letter to the Danbury Baptists is one of the most important letters in American history. It is. Let me say the point that I was trying to make is Jefferson is that he took these moments like this one, not to just say that universal application of certain eternal principles. No, that I was that was not lost on me. That's that, important about you Jefferson. know, and I, I wanted to ask him about that. You know, I, we, a couple of times we talked about how important January first was to him, and I was grateful that he explained that he got up very early <laughs> that day. But there is sort of a light-hearted end to this serious letter, which I know you know what it is. But we got a letter from John Harner. Colorado Springs listens there. He said, I heard on one of your shows something to the effect that in thanking Jefferson for his strong support of the First Amendment, someone gifted him a ham or perhaps an entire hog. Was that from the Danbury Baptists or was it a congressional representative? Could you clarify for me who gave him this gift? Thank you. I don't think it was a ham. No, but there was something. The world's largest cheese. I've never... Read anything he used about to, a ham? He, no, he used to trot the world's art. I mean, this was a huge cheese. This was—you ever seen those European cheeses, the the size of wagon? You know, wheels. and we've we've talked about this, this before, was. but explain, lay this out for our listeners, if you can, quickly. A pastor in Massachusetts, in the Cheshire Hills, decided that it would be appropriate for himself and his his associates, his farmer friends, to make for Jefferson the world's largest cheese. It, to honor Jefferson and and also to call attention to Jefferson's uh, love of of religious liberty, so they did, and they said they milked like over eight hundred Republican cows, no Federalist <laughs> cows, no <Yeah>. Federalists, <laughs> yeah. and they built this gigantic cheese, and it Republican really was Republican cows, right? Yeah. yeah, well, there was a little sense of humor about it, and then <laughs> they delivered it. They, you know, you there's no like FedEx, so they deliver the world's largest cheese to Jefferson, and Jefferson thinks, oh, great. You know, how good can that cheese be? And But he paid them $200 because Jefferson, you know, was – he really took the emoluments clause seriously. So he gives them a check for $200, which you is a fortune. You can't, can't give me a gift. I must pay you for I, it. I'm not taking – you know. But then it, it, it hung around the White House like forever. Because how do you eat the world's largest cheese? Well, so, people would come though and ask to taste it, right? right? So I, I did some research on this at one point. It's actually a fabulous story. So but Leland, the pastor, delivered a, um, a sermon – in Washington, about Jefferson, make, calling him basically the Solomon of our time, and praised his uh, wall of separation between church and state. They served up some of the cheese, but that's a lot of cheese. So Jefferson kept it around for years. You know, you can cut off the bad part of a cheese and get to the the, the good side the, below the rind and the mold. And then we have stories of people coming to the White House. And they would say to his aide, you know, at one point his aide was Meriwether Lewis, but there were others, and they would say, uh, "Could I see? Do you think? Do you think I could see the cheese?" <laughs> and then the aide would say, "Well, I, yeah, don't t- don't tell anyone, but uh, yeah, come with me." And then, they, and on occasions they'd wheel it out, 
But this cheese had a long life, and it becomes a kind of a joke. And then people made fun of him because it's Jefferson, and the Federalists and his detractors called it the mammoth cheese because of Jefferson's interest in the woolly mammoth. And they thought, this is the kind of crazy, zany, eccentric that we expect from Jefferson. Now he's got a mammoth cheese. But Jefferson was completely serene about all of this. So I think that the ham was actually a cheese. Well, well it's a maybe, great story. It's per, a wonderful yeah, story. Yeah, perhaps somebody has some more information. But if on there's that. a ham, I, you know, I've once received, and and this to the you know talk about a ukulele. Smithfield, are you listening? Send hams. <laughs> One time they sent us a ham. Really? You, I gave you some of it. I don't recall. They sent this huge package of Smithfield That must have been ham. the previous semi-permanent. I don't ham. think so. Yeah. But so Smithfield, are you listening? And then there's a letter here from Brad Chrysler. Which I don't know if Our you've seen friend. this or I have not. not. No, I have not. Um, it just came in, and uh, you must what see do, this. What does Brad say? Uh, Happy New Year's uh, to us, and hope to see us see us in North Dakota as soon as it thaws. He's coming. So he'll never come. He can yeah. teach me the uh, ukulele. He said, I've come across a very interesting piece recently, and wondered if you guys might help by forwarding it along to any appropriate contacts at Monticello. And it's a portrait, a miniature portrait from 1820, that he thinks may have a Jefferson connection. And I'll leave it at that, but let's try to get a hold of, of him and perhaps someone at Monticello would be willing to take a look at the photographs. Well, my friend Ann Lucas will. You know, so say, let me say this about our friend uh, Brad Crisler. He's a serious artist. Yes, he is. And he's an even more serious collector of miniatures. Mm -hmm. So when I was in at St. Andrews in Edinburgh last year when my daughter graduated from St. Andrews in history, we went to the Scottish National Gallery and there we pulled out several of those museum shelves, and there were miniatures, including miniatures by Richard Cosway. Hmm. Richard Cosway, the husband of mm -hmm. Maria Cosway, Jefferson's last great love. And there they were. And, and Richard Cosway was a splendid miniaturist, and Brad Crisler has done a lot of research into this zone. And he has sent you a painting of of none other than John Adams, not a miniature, but a beautiful painting. We will pass this on to my friend Ann Lucas. Meanwhile, you're off to... Uh, Loxaw Lodge. Shortly. So. so this is my annual winter retreat period where we're doing two, uh, one on Shakespeare, one on water in the West. And David, I'll tell you this. I have been reading books about water in the West, including Mark Reisner's famous uh, classic, uh, Cadillac Desert. But I'll tell you one that I recommend to everyone and you too. Hmm. And that is a book called The Emerald Mile. Well, I've heard of that. The Emerald Mile is about the Colorado River in 1983. Oh, yes. You told me about this. Right. When these knuckleheads decided to run a wooden dory called the Emerald Mile through the Grand Canyon when the Colorado River was out of control. And these knuckleheads, these three guys, decided to, to set the record – for going through the Grand Canyon, and they did. Unbelievably I have to take a look brave, for that book. bold, and stupid. And when they got out, when they got to Grand Wash Cliffs at the end of the Grand Canyon, they were immediately arrested <laughs> because they had taken such a huge risk. It, it's time for us to go to uh, this week's Jefferson Watch, your essay. But before we do... Uh, uh, I know we have one more show before you leave. We're going to talk about Theodore Roosevelt next week. Because he died on January 6th, so we're 1919. Pretty close to that. Yeah. But maybe uh, uh, let's make a date for when you come back to uh, – uh, I don't know if you can record any comments from this. Of course. I'm taking a recorder. Or, or, or at least uh, kind of report in and maybe we'll discuss that further. Meanwhile, I'll look for that book. And then I'm also urging people to read the book by Robert Kagan called The Jungle Grows Back – about America's place in the world, the liberal world order, The Jungle Grows Back, Robert Kagan. I hope people will read it and send in their thoughts and questions. And next week we'll uh, we'll announce this year's book club. The first book is by a friend of mine, actually, Akhil Reed Amar of Yale Law School, and the book is called The Constitution Today. That'll be the February edition of the Thomas Jefferson Book Club. Yeah, and you can find out more by going to jeffersonhour.com forward slash book club or go to jeffersonhour.com. You can support the show and find out a lot more about it. But now, sir, it is time for this week's Jefferson Watch. Thank you, David. When Congress met on January 3rd, 2019, Rashida Tlaib, 
the first Palestinian-American woman elected to the Congress of the United States, took her oath on a copy of the Koran. She had intended to take the oath on a copy owned by Thomas Jefferson, but in the end she decided to use her own Koran. The Library of Congress had made Jefferson's copy available to her for the ceremony, as it did back in 2007 for Minnesota Representative Keith Ellison. Why uplift someone else, Tlaib said. It's starting a new era in social justice. It just occurred to me, why am I not using my own? Probably Jefferson's complicity with slavery caused her to decline to use his copy, but her first impulse had been right. She wanted to remind America that Islam has been a part of our national story from the beginning and that one of our greatest presidents possessed a copy of the Koran. Why did Jefferson own a copy of the Islamic holy book? We don't certainly know, but I can offer two partial explanations. First, Jefferson was deeply interested in the ways in which different civilizations had tried to understand the idea of God. Jefferson himself was disinclined to use the term God because of the baggage it carries, particularly Old Testament baggage. He preferred to speak of the Creator, Alexander Pope's great first cause, the master celestial physicist who created the universe and spun the planets in their orbits. Jefferson was certain that there was an all-powerful designing agent behind the order of the cosmos, but he was uncomfortable with equating that Newtonian entity with the jealous, biased, and judgmental God, human, all too human, of the Old Testament. Because he believed in God but thought that his own Judeo-Christian tradition had misunderstood the high-mindedness and the benevolence of that being, Jefferson was eager to explore how other religions tried to make sense of Godhead. Moreover, the Enlightenment, of which Jefferson was America's greatest exemplar, had a special fascination with Islam because Islam has only one God, Allah, not the three-personed God of Christianity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like most intellectuals of the Enlightenment, Jefferson was embarrassed by the idea of the Trinity, which he regarded as a remnant of ancient polytheism. Whatever might be wrong with Islam, what was right about it was its monotheism. Indeed, the greatest historian of the age, Edward Gibbon, wrote a fascinated, favorable chapter on Islam in his monumental book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Jefferson's second reason for owning the Koran is that he wanted to study it to determine what it meant by the term jihad. One of the chronic problems of Mediterranean commerce in that era was the piracy of the Islamic states in northern Africa, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, etc. Islamic pirates preyed on non-Islamic ships, including American trade ships. The pirates were privateers. That is, they did not officially represent the Islamic states. They were not state-sponsored, but they were state-tolerated and even state-encouraged. When they were challenged by European and American diplomats, including Jefferson and John Adams, the Islamic states defended their actions by arguing that the Quran required that they must convert infidels, and those who refused conversion could be jailed, tortured, or even killed. Jefferson found this practice intolerable, and he wanted to study the Quran to see if that meaning of jihad were central to the Islamic religion or just a convenient excuse put forward by thugs and terrorists. This is what I love about Thomas Jefferson, his insatiable intellectual curiosity, his scholarly discipline coupled with his lifelong commitment to being the champion of the American Republic in a dangerous and predatory world. But there's even a greater reason to take the oath of office on Jefferson's copy of the Koran. More than any other American statesman, Jefferson stood for absolute religious liberty. He believed a person's religion was no business of the state, period. That every religion was equally legitimate and that no person should ever be rewarded or punished for her or his religious views in a free society. This is one of the fundamental principles of American life enshrined in the First Amendment. And yet we find ourselves needing to recommit ourselves to this self-evident truth again and again and again in the course of our national experiment. There were people then, and there are people now, who would legitimize their own religious views, but outlaw those of others who do not share those views. 
It's simply magnificent that nestled among Jefferson's 7,000 books is a copy of the Koran, along with Plato's Republic and John Locke's Second Treatise on Government and John Milton's Areopagitica. No person in American life, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln, could bring more credibility to the idea of universal respect and universal tolerance in matters of conscience. It is equally wonderful that the Library of Congress makes Jefferson's Quran available on occasions like this, even though its responsibility is to preserve and protect Jefferson's books like, well, sacred objects, the Library of Congress rightly understands that Jefferson's Koran is even more important for the principle it represents than for its status as one of the treasures of the individual who made the Library of Congress a universal library of the best that has been thought and known in the history of civilization. I think Representative Talib should have gone with her first instinct and placed her hand on Jefferson's Koran on January 3rd. Fault him as you wish, but I'd rather place my aspirations for a nation of religious liberty on the shoulders of Thomas Jefferson than on any other individual in American history. I would say God bless Thomas Jefferson, but I suppose the right conclusion is, Creator, thank you for constructing your great chain of being at the top of which resides humanity, a select few of whom have taken the time to understand the foundational principles of human happiness and have given their lives to articulating and defending those sacred principles. Amen. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-828. 2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson.